Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. Can you tell us briefly about your path, how you see your path to the work you do, and if there's a, a, an experience or a mentor in childhood or college, let us, let us get a feeling for how you became this Daniel Zibla. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for doing this, and thanks everybody for coming this evening. Um, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I think maybe uh, I'll, I'll start my story. The year after college, I went. I spent a year in Germany, um, uh, or actually, after a year after high school, uh, I spent the year in Germany uh, and traveled around the East German countryside. Um, this was the year of German unification, oh. so I really was able to see kind of firsthand the kind of the legacy of, the, of communism immediately. And so became very interested in politics in Germany and the history of Germany. You know, you kind of felt when you went to East Germany in 1990 um, that you were, it was sort of, sort of a time capsule where the landscapes looked as if, you know, they were sort of almost pre-war in some sense of so the countryside. And so I became deeply interested in German history. And I think I, you know, so I spent college studying German history, German politics, spent some years in Germany in college and really began to focus primarily in my research on 19, the 19th century Germany and early 20th century German history. And so this, of course, turned me to the study of democracy and the failures of democracy. So um, that's really what I spent my academic career studying. And so, I, you know, I, in a certain way, I, I think, you know, between the time I became an assistant professor up through, you know, a few years ago, I was studying relatively obscure topics but from my point of view. You know, I was studying something that was interesting to other academics, other historians of Germany trying to understand how is it that this very rich uh, d democracy, uh, Germany in the 1920s and 1930, a very promising democracy, an incredible constitution designed by Max Weber and other very yeah. smart men um, with, a, with a, you know, advanced civilization and wonderful universities and so on, could go, how things could go so wrong. Um, and, you know, so in 2016, when the, uh, 2015, 2016, when Donald Trump started f first a campaign for office, you know, I saw all of these incredible parallels, okay. um, and uh, and so it. You know, suddenly my my domain of knowledge became relevant, and so that's kind of how I sort of stumbled into this. I think. And how did uh, you and uh, Stephen Levitsky decide to collaborate? Yeah, well, we're, we went to graduate school at the same place. We, he was a couple years ahead of me. Um, we both teach in the same department at Harvard, and so we've taught courses together on, demo on democracy. He studies Latin America. I primarily focus on European politics. But when we teach graduate courses on, Europe, on democracy, we would, you know, we read all the same texts. And so I remember we were waiting in line for coffee I think in, in the summer, fall of 2016, and it was after one of these presidential debates with Hillary Clinton where, uh, where, where uh, Trump had said he, wouldn't, he may not accept the results of elections. And, that, and so we were waiting in line for coffee, and we always assigned this reading by Juan Linz, a great Spanish political scientist, where he had this list. Of, it was a book written in 1978, you know, long before Trump, uh, saying what are the kind of hallmarks of an authoritarian or when should you be worried. And one of the things that he said is that, you know, if people don't accept, if they promise not to accept election results. They, you know, politicians we sometimes think don't do what they promise, but often they do uh, they do what they promise. And if they, don't, if they say they're not going to accept elections, maybe they won't. So this really sent off alarm bells for us, and that's what sort of sent us on the path of, of working on this. And how do you work together? I'm just, I mean, yeah. in addition to the content, yes. I'm sort of curious, you know, yeah, yeah. There's, a very, there's a lot of research, there's a yes. lot of writing. How do yeah. you toss it back and forth? Yeah, well, you know, we often begin sort of dividing up chapters, but at the end we end up, you know, just going back and forth so much I mean, we have areas of expertise. I mean, the stuff that's on Europe is sort of my domain. The stuff that's on Latin America is his. And, but we, you know, we send things back and forth between each other so often, paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, that 
and you know, spend hours on the phone um, discussing these things so that in the end it's hard to figure out who wrote what. I mean, it's really, you know, we, we send it back and forth to such a degree that our fingerprints are on the whole thing, I would say. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. I haven't heard too many collaborators yeah. who say paragraph by paragraph yeah, yeah, or yeah. sentence by sentence. And um, although you've been digging in these trenches for years, yeah. was there anything that surprised you in, as you were researching it and working on it? For, the, for this book. This book. Yeah, the, well, one of the stories we tell in the book is um, the story of February 6, 1934 in France, which was something I, although I teach courses on European politics, I didn't uh, know much about this story, but it's an inc incredible set of events. I mean, maybe we can get into it. I don't know if you would. Get into yeah, it now. Okay, so, yeah, so this was a set of events that I had not really known. I had read about it and actually ref saw in a book that I had written back in 2017, <laughs> had referred to it, but didn't really fully understand the importance of it. So February 6, 1934, was a day, you know, France in 1930s was a kind of model democracy. It was the long, longest standing democracy in a sense. And, you know, the Third Republic was, um, you know, was a thriving democracy through the late 19th century. In the 1930s, I think French, the French thought of their democracy as a potential model for the rest of the world. But by 1934, uh, you know, the people were, a lot of people were dissatisfied. And on February 6, 1934, there was a gathering, we, we tell this story in the book, there was a gathering of, of um, militia groups, veterans gathered in, this, in the plaza right in front of the French National Assembly. So if you've been to Paris, you maybe know this place. It's right along the bridge, along the river. And they were angry. They were wearing uniforms, some different, you know, it's all a kind of ragtag group of hundreds and hundreds of, of these guys armed with sticks and clubs and police showed up. These guys had long poles with razor blades at the end. The police showed up to protect the parliament. Inside the parliament building, there was a vote going on for um, the new, the new uh, prime minister. They were Why does the this bells. all sound so familiar? Yes, yeah. right, exactly. So, you know, I didn't know the story. So, and so they got, you know, they, the police gathered out in front to kind of protect the building. And these guys were out front and they had, these were groups with the name, you know, the national, they were all nationalists and resented the corrupt, uh, you know, socialist infused Third Republic as they described it. And uh, I mentioned the sticks with razor blades because the, Im you know, the image that, that's described um, by historians is that they use these sticks to cut at the legs of the horses, the police officers were on horses. Um, and so you know, they, they attacked the building, the police basically rebuffed them, kept them out of the building. They were, there was chants the day before of hang the deputies, hang the deputies. Um, and members of the French parliament escaped, he could hear this, there were some journalists in the building who recounted this live firsthand. Um, and the members of parliament escaped out the back, uh, and th th none of the members of parliament were, were killed, but there were deaths on the day, some of the protesters, some police officers, and the, you know, and the kind of day came to an end, and you know, the, this was an assault on the, the Third Republic, and some members of the parliament decided that this was an assault on the Republic and said this was a terrible event, but what then became clear afterwards was that there were members of the center-right party, the Republican Federation, that were in the building, who had been in on the deal. They knew what was happening. They knew it was coming. They were supportive of this. So again, I mean, it's the, the parallels are incredibly uncanny. And an investigation was opened um, to kind of try to understand what had gone wrong. And kind of one of the points of our book is that, um, you know, these kinds of assaults happen from time to time in democracies. But what's really critical is how do mainstream politicians respond to this? And uh, what was clear in the case of, in the French case, is that some, some responded well, condemned it, said this was an outrageous attack, but there were members of the, of the center-right parties who were sympathetic to it, who said it wasn't that big of a deal, it was the police were to blame, uh, actually the communists started it, there was communists in, you know, among the protesters, uh, so they opened an investigation, and unlike the US, I mean, to make the parallel really cl uh, clear, where, um, you know, that were, you know, the, the, part, the investigation was all in one party. The, the, the center-right politicians got involved in the committee but blocked the investigation the whole way. And so there was no accountability. So, so the, the, the broader point of the comparison is to say, you know, how do mainstream politicians respond to these threats? And in this case, the French right responded poorly. I mean, they tried to cover up, they tried to cover it up, they tried to say it wasn't a big deal. And so no, these guys were never held to account. And so, uh, you know, by, by 1940, the time that, you know, the, the Nazis invaded Germany, and an authoritarian government was established, many of those guys who were in the streets that day, they kind of formed an alumni association in a way. Uh, and it would, they, they hired these guys into the government. And so 
the minister of Jewish affairs who oversaw the deportation of Jews was one of the leaders of the protest movement. So these in guys 30, the, in, in the, the 34, leaders in 34 is came now back, was now in a position, in a position of position power. And so by not holding these guys to account, uh, this weakened the immune system of the French political system. Right. Now in the book, you also uh, gives examples where uh, uh, in the, with the Peronists, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's other places where things go a different way. Right, where, where yeah. they are con roundly condemned, and yes. it, it's the ripple effect, it's the, con the long-term consequences, right. the midterm consequences that in some sense you focus on. Yeah, so another event that we describe in the book is uh, Spain in 1981, shortly after the transition to democracy, uh, there was uh, the members of parliament were in the parliament building. This, the story starts to get a little tired, but they were in there <laughs> counting up the ballots for the new prime minister. And uh, these soldiers came running into the building, an attempted military coup. In this case, though, the opposite kind of thing happened, where uh, the king came out and condemned it. But even just as important, I think, were that uh, the center-right politicians, the communists, the socialists, the former Francoist, uh, fascist uh, guys who had been in charge of the Franco regime, all came out, condemned this as an uh, unacceptable outrage. They led this protest through Madrid. These uh, partisan rivals were arm in arm marching through the streets and saying this was unacceptable and Spanish democracy has been stable to this day. So again, the question is how do mainstream politicians respond to these assaults? That's really the key thing to focus so on. So let's stay with this sort of broad uh, a picture of authoritarianism and democracy and then go into the U.S. specifically. Yeah. But so how do you um, uh, briefly define authoritarianism. When, do, when is a country moving in that direction into anti-democratic authoritarianism? Yeah, so th there's, there's warning signs of politicians who are, who are, th are going to threaten democracy. And so some of the things that we think are really important, and we kind of lay these on, this is built a bit built on Juan Linz, the political scientist I mentioned before. You know, if you have politicians who say they're not going to accept elections, this is a bad sign. If they use violence, this is a bad sign. If they condemn the media, this is a bad sign. So there are all these kind of warning signs. But I guess your question is more, what, how do you know a regime is decaying once you're, once you're in it? Yeah, a system. Yes. Yeah. yes. And so... Um, yeah, there's lots of things to look at, but I, I mean, I sort of think of democracy as really constituting three main pillars. Um, and so, you know, one is certainly participation and inclusion. People need to be able to participate in politics. And if any effort to restrict that by res making it harder to vote or restricting legal access to the ballot or any form of political participation is a bad sign. These days, that in most democracies, that's hard to do. Of course, in the U.S., we do see signs of this taking place in a lot of states. A second thing that, and a more common uh, kind of, the second pillar of democracy, I would say, is a competition. What democracy is about is free and fair competition between political rivals, parties, or politicians. And there needs to be, essentially, you know, when a, an incumbent goes to sleep at night before an election, he should be a little nervous that he might lose his, uh, he might lose the election, you know. So there has to be genuine competition. If you don't have that, if the incumbent can kind of rig the game, and rig the rules in a way that makes it so it's really hard to dislodge the incumbent, then that means you have a democracy that's in trouble. Orban. Orban. Viktor Orban is somebody who has done this, who's redrawn the election districts to such a degree that he can get 60% of the vote, 60% of the seats, not necessarily 60% of the vote, but 60% of the seats. And then the final thing to look at, the third pillar, so participation, competition, the third big pillar that I think of when I think about democracy is civil liberties, freedom of press, freedom of association, freedom of religion, and it's very common for authoritarians to assault this, especially freedom of the press. And so if any of these kind of basic principles are being violated, then, you know, a democracy is in trouble. Uh, I assume you're familiar with Astra Taylor's yeah. uh, book. And yes, she right. has a book and a documentary, yeah. What is Democracy? Yeah. Or, or I, I think the, 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 the documentary is What is Democracy? The book is um, We May Not Have Democracy, But You Miss It When It's Gone, or right. something like right. that. Right. So, but, but she introduced me to Plato's Dilemma. Uh -huh, I don't know. Yeah, oh, I'm not sure. okay, okay. So I'm going to learn something. Plato, we, we consider Athens the, the sort right. of the model early uh, democracy. Plato said that democracy will inevitably lead to tyranny uh -huh. because the rich always want to get richer. The poor will then ultimately follow any demagogue who promises to overthrow the rich, leading to tyranny. Yeah. And I mean, this is, yeah. this is basically. Yeah. what we see over and over again and what we can smell in America as well. Yeah, so these, these classical thinkers sort of thought that this was, there was a kind of inevitable cycle, that monarchies would degenerate into tyrannies, that 
aristocracies would degenerate into oligarchies and that democracies would kind of result in the kind of mob rule and the rise of demagogues. You know, and so the, I think you know, the, the classical thinkers were right, I think, that there are these tendencies, but I, I guess my reaction to that is that to treat these as inevitable cycles is, is not quite right. I mean, that we can, we've learned a lot since then, and we can design our political institutions in a way to protect ourselves. <laughs> and, and most countries have. Yeah, and so I think that's <laughs> right. So I think it's, it's not, there's nothing inevitable about it, yeah. is what I would Very say. Very good. Yeah. You open the book contrasting January 5th and January 6th, 2021. Yeah. I'll throw it to you to, yeah. to paint that picture to them because I think it really is a, a starting point for this whole perspective, this whole conversation. Yeah, so January 6th uh, is the day that we, you know, lots of people think about it. It was a, a terrible day of authoritarian assault, but we sometimes forget that 24 hours before that, January 5th was this remarkable day of incredible promise where uh, in Georgia, you had the first African-American elected Senate. You had a, a Jewish-American elected to the Senate as well. And so it was a day, in fact, that civil rights activists had been working for for generations. Um, and so it was this incredible, it was a kind of, so I think it's important to, to kind of juxtapose these two dates for two reasons. One, it reflects the two strands in American political life. I mean, I think there's, you know, there, there, that we have these contradictory strands, it's, and we've always had these contradictory strands, a push for inclusion. I mean, this goes back to the 1830s at least, put push for inclusion, for making, you know, tr treating all citizens, everybody uh, of all backgrounds equally, um, and including expanding the political community, and then forces of reaction against that. And, and, and so these are, these are both present, and they were present within 24 hours of each other uh, on that day. But they also are actually causally related in the sense right. that pu pushes for inclusion often generate pushes reactions, authoritarian reactions, efforts to re-restrict uh, kind of, and, and kind of to try to reinforce hierarchies exactly as they're being dismantled. So another chapter in our book, we talk about the Jim Crow era. We have a, a description of the Jim Crow era in the South. And you know, this incredible, pro incredibly promising era after the Civil War where you know, the 14th Amendment is passed, the 15th Amendment is passed, these efforts to kind of expand the political community, uh, to, to males at least, uh, but of all backgrounds, and then the reaction against that. So we've had these area, these kind of moments in our in our past, where, and, and I think in a way that's we're living through a similar era today, in particular with regards to race. I mean, one of the things that's um, the, the unique challenge in a sense, or, or you know, a challenge in the U.S. That's, that's gone further than another democracy is the fact that we do live in a diverse society an incredibly diverse society, more diverse than many West European societies, uh, although many are also That's right. Struggling Migration with, is transforming yeah, yes. them. They're now reckoning with some of the same, same issues exactly. we are. But we've been in right. that state for a while. And, you know, and I think European societies deal with the legacy of colonialism, and that in some sense is kind of their, the, their right. kind of a, a analog. But, you know, this effort to create a, a multiracial democracy is, is an important and, and in some ways awe-inspiring project. And, I, and I, at times I feel very optimistic about this. Um, you know, and that when we came, before we came on, the description of what happened in the United States in the early 1940s, I mean, this is this incredible moment in our own history. Um, so there have been these moments to, to make our political uh, universe more equitable, more inclusive, and then there are these moments of reaction. And that's kind of one way of thinking about what's happening right now. That's right. That's right. There is that that uh, that is where the cycles do seem to happen. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, progress. Right. Backlash. Right. Progress. Backlash. Right. Yeah. When one feels threatened, when an animal is cornered, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Right. and that's right. what we sort of see. Um, I, I'm going to read something because I think it sets. It, it's from your book, which which I think sets the um, brings us to the U.S. situation, and and this is one of the things that I. Suppose I knew, but didn't really know. Mm. Um, in 1800, which is the, the first time one party is going to peacefully leave and let another party uh, ascend. In 1800, the norm of accepting defeat and handing power to one's opponent had not yet taken hold. The very existence of partisan opposition was regarded as illegitimate. Politicians, including many of the founders, equated it with sedition and even treason to speak against the, 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 the sitting government. The norm of accepting defeat and peacefully relinquishing power is the foundation of modern democracy. And on March 4, 1801, the United States became the first republic in history to experience an electoral transfer of power from one political party to another. I think I had not realized how unprecedented that was. 
Yeah, so what was so critical about that? I mean, two things about it. One, you know, that's a republic. First of all, we don't have a monarchy. I mean, there had been changes of power with, between the Tories and the Whigs in control of the parliament, but this was all within the context of a, of a monarchical system. So to have a system where you don't have a monarch, where it's really, there, you know, there is no third party kind of offering legitimacy to things. I mean, these are politicians who are in struggle with each other, and what was distinctive about this was that this was the, the, happening at the time that political parties were being invented for the very first time. Political parties hadn't existed, and you know George Washington's famous farewell address, he, can, he decried parties as, as a threat to, as a threat to everything that was valuable. You know, it was kind of narrow-minded factionalism, and I think that spirit still is with us in our kind of skepticism of partisanship and so on. I mean, that today we kind of lots of people are distrustful of parties and think, well, can't we look out for the general? you know, general will and the general the common community. good. Yeah, the common good and so on. So so the so this tran transfer of uh, power from the Federalists, the Democratic Republicans, from the Adams administration to the Jefferson administration is I mean it's oft sometimes called the second revolution because it was such a remarkable And you transition. say by the way that that nobody was absolutely sure that's how it would happen. Yes, right. That's what that's what I as well I mean you asked what were things I I learned and I mean I didn't really fully appreciate because in some ways we look back at this and say, well, of course we did this. We had this figured out, and you know, this is what you know, this is what it means to be an American. Is we have these transfers of power. But in 1800, you know, they, they, they were kind of operating in the dark. There's a wonderful line from Madison um, to Jefferson, where right after the convention, where he says, "I feel like we're in the the woods, and there's no footsteps to guide us." And so I think you know that gives a sense of, you know, they were engaged in something entirely new, um, and so. You know, and if you th and it's quite natural to think if you think you know what's right, uh, why would you ever give up power to somebody who you know is wrong, right? And especially for the Federalists, who were in some ways like other post-colonial founders of nations. I mean, this happens in many post-colonial societies. The first party that gains power, they kind of have this kind of syndrome of a kind of founder. We call it in the book a founder's dilemma. I mean, you know, people who set up organizations sometimes oh, have a tough time. Oh, yes. deal with this all yeah, the time. Yeah, have a difficulty yes. stepping down, right? So these guys felt that they, the Federalists, they knew what they were doing. And, and you know, the, these kind of, you know, slightly odd radicals who seem to be sympathetic to the French Revolution, we don't want to give power to these guys. Uh, and so ultimately they did, but it was, there was the threat of, I mean, what we recount in the book is there's the threat of civil war and violence all around this. Um, and, you know, that some of the state's militias were arming themselves in preparation for what might happen. Um, and, you know, ultimately they did the transfer of power did happen, but it was very contested. Yeah. Um, I think let's shift now to some of the flaws, gaps, weaknesses in the Constitution. Um, and, and as uh, Daniel and Stephen point out, while there may be 20 to 30 percent authoritarian or anti-democratic forces in other Western representative democracies, the only one in which they they've been able to win the national executive is the U.S. and because of the Electoral College. But I think another thing that was uh, at least a new in a way of like, oh, that's right, was similar to what we were just talking about with 1800, was that when they were writing the Constitution, they were making it up. Yeah. And, 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 and some of the gaps and flaws are because they feared the majority. Yeah, so I, you know, we have a tendency to think that the Constitution was this master plan, this blueprint that was designed by people who are very for, you know, far-sighted. And you know, the founders were brilliant in many ways. The Constitution is a brilliant document. But it is true that it's a series of compromises. It's a series. It's, it's the reflection of a series of improvisations, uh, and and political leaders in a hurry trying to you know sitting in this very hot room, uh, in the muggy Philadelphia in, right, summer, yes. you know, with the windows closed so that journalists couldn't peek in, desperate to kind of finish the meeting. I mean, you know, at first maybe they're kind of inspired to do something <laughs> big, but as you know, what if you've ever been in a meeting, you know, at some point you kind of say, okay, let enough already here, right? So. You know, so there, there were certain things that they had real difficulty dealing with, and one, the, the most difficult thing was how to select the president. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, there had never been a system in which you have an elected executive, right, that was, you know, republics were a quite rare phenomena. So they didn't quite know how to do this. 
And then you add to the mix that you have these states, and there's you know the state of Delaware who wants to say you know if we don't get full representation with the small states, we're going to take off. We will go. You know the British are out there. Well, they'll be happy to accept us as an ally. And so there's this kind of national security threat that the French might intervene, the British might intervene, and so out of desperation in a certain way, they have to come up with some quick solutions. And and we recount there's there was a committee formed, the Committee of Unfinished Parts. Where the things they they couldn't figure Imagine. out. Imagine, yeah, yeah we don't it, we don't learn about that. Yeah, in, so we, in, in high school, right? So this was put to the very end, and the committee of unfinished parts said, like, okay, we have to come up with a solution." So they came up with this kind of improvised solution that was like the third best option. I mean, Madison himself had wanted his initial plan, the, the Virginia plan, which he was really the author of. His vision of how the executive should be selected was actually very similar to how prime ministers are selected today, where his thought was that the Congress should select the president. Um, and so the, whoever has the majority in the Congress should select the president. That was dropped because some of the states were afraid that the big states would win out. So this was a negotiation. You know, it's, I, don't, I don't mean to diminish it because it was, it was a quite creative solution, but the point is this is, this is the, you know, we treat it like it's the Ark of the Covenant or something, like it came down from on high, but this is a man-made set of institutions that, w that were very effective in many ways, but also we have to kind of at some point look back and say, maybe at some point we need to improve them. And in fact, our history has been filled with efforts. You know, we've all done the hard work throughout our history of trying to improve the Constitution. But we've lagged way behind so many other democracies. Yeah. You point this out. Democracies who started with systems similar to us, you point out that Latin America, many of the countries, when they achieved their independence, yeah. uh, went with electoral colleges, all of whom have dropped them. That's right. Other things like that, that the, the systems that were, and, and there's that thing of that we are the oldest yeah. democracy. Well, you sort of think, well, you wouldn't want to be in the oldest airplane right. or right. the oldest doc, the oldest medical procedure, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the things that I, that, I, that I think is clear, and I think people are aware of this, is that the founders themselves knew that. Yes. And what they said about it in their post-Constitution press conferences, whether right. it was Franklin or Washington and so on, and Jefferson, was this is a work in progress. Yeah, so, Frank, uh, so Washington himself, I think it was a, two months or so after the convention wrote, I think it was his nephew uh, saying, okay. you know, this is an imperfect document. We, we had no monopoly on truth and virtue, um, and it's up to future generations to improve it. Um, and, and in fact, you know, I have to say that there is an American tradition of improving our Constitution. I mean, the Bill of Rights itself was, you know, in, written after the, the Constitutional Convention. Uh, after the Civil War, we have all of these constitutional amendments. Uh, during the Progressive Era, the women gain the right to vote. We elect senators now after this, but beginning the beginning of the 20th century, rather than appointing them. So there is a tradition. And then civil rights in and, the 60s and, and, and 70s. Civil, right, Those exactly. are like the three eras, these kind the, of. of yeah, Neoliberal. exactly, exactly. And so there are these eras of, tr of trying to improve the cons our Constitution, and I think there is an American tradition of this. What, um, what I think has happened, and uh, as in other democracies, I mean, we recount the story of Norway, which is the world's second oldest written constitution after the United States, written you know, right at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. When it was written, it was much less democratic than the American Constitution. The, the Norwegian Constitution has been amended over 200 times, 300 times, uh, and and so it's a today Norway has a perfect score according to Freedom House. So it's oh much, yes, and so you know the the ease of ch ch of amending the constitution. So let me yeah. just so, so people yeah. there are there are institutions that sort of rate democracies how democratic, how free is your press, etc. And what you're saying is, the, Norway ranks at the top now, yes. and where do we rank? Well, you know we. Up until 2016, we were we had a score. They scored from zero to 100. We had a score of 93. The U.S. had a score of 93. They have all these indices and measures, which was kind of on par with Britain, uh, Canada, Germany, and so on. And really, the motivation for our book is that between 2016 and 2020, today we're ranked at 83, which is two points behind Argentina, the same level as uh, Panama. So you know, which which. Yeah, no, 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 no knock on them. No, not at but, all, not at all. But you know, if you're in a if you're in a country where you have election officials' lives being threatened, where you have an incumbent not willing to accept the uh, results of an election, if you have voting rights under assault, those are things that will make Freedom House drop your score. And so yeah. that's that's what's happened. Yeah. Now, one of the things that that struck me when I think about the founders saying, "Here, here it is. It's a work in progress." 
you know, make it better. And then we find, I mean, the Bill of Rights, yes, that happens yeah. pretty quickly, but it is a very hard constitution to amend. Yes. And there is this, uh, what, what I wrote was that, could it be that while condemning and attempting to outlaw the rule of religion or monarchy, that the next generation endowed the founders, their writings, their rulings, with the kind of restrictive veneration that you reserve for religion or monarchies. Yeah, right, yeah, no, it is. The US Constitution is, uh, I mean, the comparative constitutional scholars study this and they've come up with ways of measuring how hard is it to change a constitution. The US Constitution is the hardest constitution in the world to change. I mean, so we have, you know, you have to have two, you know, there's two pathways to amend the Constitution. You have a c convention, which I think is not something we've done and I think is not a good idea. Although Gavin Newsom is trying for it. Yeah, so, yeah. so but you know, I think you can amend the Constitution through the normal procedure that's been done, which is two-thirds of the House of Representatives votes for it, two-thirds of the Senate has to approve it, and then three-quarters of the states have to approve it. And this, and when you think of three-quarters of the states, these have to be approved by both chambers in these states. So this is, you know, we're talking about nine, you know, lots of legislative bodies. So it's cumbersome broad. That's why we've amended only 27 times. So this, and if people yeah. are aware, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment for women has not been ratified. Yeah. Um, right. Women do, do not have in, 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 in the Constitution right. equal rights. Right. That's right. And so, and there's been efforts to come, catch up with this legislatively, of course, but we have to kind of find these workarounds, whereas other countries can embed these things in our Constitution. But what, what, yeah. do you have, as you were looking at this history, it's just one of the things that just stuck in my mind. This shift from a generation of revolutionaries yeah. who found a country and create a Constitution are followed by folks who sort of venerate what they did and won't take the next step to get yeah. rid of the electoral college or something like that. What 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 went on culturally well, there? Yeah, but you know, I do think we continue to amend it though. I mean, yeah. through through. When I, was the last yeah. time? Uh, well, the la there was an amendment in the '90s, which was um, a kind of th thing about uh, salary for congressmen. Right. So it's not a democratizing legislation. So I really think the break came in 1970, uh, which is so I would say for the last 50 years we've sort of abandoned this tradition. Um, and uh, you know the, the particular thing that changed, and this is right before the, the failure of the Equal Rights Amendment. But yes. So the in 19 the late 1960s there was this effort to get rid of the Electoral College, um, and this incredible event, incredible you know, and, and you know, I was born in 1972, so I didn't I didn't I didn't experience this directly, but learning the history of this is remarkable, where this was something that both the leaders of both parties were in favor of. Uh, Richard Nixon Bipartisan, was in favor of it. Richard Nixon. The Chamber of Commerce was in favor of it. The AFL-CIO, the American Bar Association, and 70% of Americans, according to surveys. So it passed, that got the two-thirds majority in, this, in the House of Representatives. Majority of senators supported it, but it came very close, but it was needed, defeated. It needed two-thirds in the, in the Senate, but you had um, um, some Southern senators who were against the, uh, uh, eliminating this, and so it stalled out. It failed. There was further attempts up through the late '70s, and at that point, you know, it, it has passed. And I think that failure has kind of left all of us with this impression that it's, this just can't be done. Right. You know, and so we've, you know, the Constitution's always been hard to change, but you know, it has changed. And so part of the explanation for why it's not happening is one that it's that is hard. But two, that we've kind of lost the imagination and a kind of constitutional imagination that this kind of thing is possible. So one of the messages of this book is to say we have we have this tradition, and it's actually what's what's radical is not proposing these reforms, which is sometimes how people respond to our suggestions for reforms. What's radical is the experiment that we're engaged in of not amending the constitution. Other countries do this; we no longer do this. And and if you want to understand why our country is in the place it is. I think this is part of the explanation. So when we, and we'll, we'll go to Q&A in just a, a couple of minutes, but I want you to get a, get a little further into um, solutions and, and the, the uh, you, you lay out, and it's interesting, before they lay out the, uh, the agenda of solutions, they say, don't stop by asking whether this is possible. This is what's needed, right? Yeah. And then we'll deal with whether, how it's possible later. But uh, if you want to just share a little bit of that, and then your approach yeah. to what it takes, what it will take. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and to be clear, we say, you know, dear reader, pause for a moment, listen to the suggestions, and we'll come back at the end. So we do come up, we do yeah. lay out a sort yeah, of strategy right. for thinking about it. So I can, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, so we have 15, we have a kind of 15-point set of proposals. Um, and it's, it's not a random kind of wish list. I mean, it's really rooted 
in sort of two things. One, it's what other democracies in the world have done. And so, you know, it may sound radical to some readers, but actually it would simply put us in the mainstream of what other democracies around the world are doing, number one. Number two, they're all intended to allow more, given the title of the book, to allow for majorities to, 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 to vote to, and to govern. And our system is, because it has these pre-democratic origins, is a system in which majorities are off, so often thwarted. So to, to give some examples of, you know, we, we call for the elimination of the electoral college. We say that uh, uh, judges, national judges should have term limits or retirement age. In particular, I think uh, term limits would be particularly effective. Um, you know, that, that just to kind of give you an example why that would be so powerful, you know, currently, I mean, current, you know, we, don't, we you need judicial independence. Judicial independence is critical for a democracy to protect civil liberties and so on. You don't want a judiciary to be fully in the grips of a kind of any temporary majority. On the other hand, you don't want a judge, a set of judges who are so out of sync with where the voters are that they make decisions that run counter to what voters, you know, hmm. vast majorities of what voters want. Could that want. really happen? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and so, you know, other democracies have figured a way out of this bind, and that's by imposing term limits. And so many other democracies didn't have term limits. Every other democracy in the world, except for the United States, has term limits or retirement ages for their national uh, Right, and one thing I just want to mention, if you think about this, is that the Constitution did not dictate rules that would give us the 6-3 majority. Right. But they didn't give us rules that wouldn't. Right, right. Right? And that number that I gave of just how the Republicans, with only 12 out of the last 35 years, have appointed the vast majority of judges, that's because at some point, other than McConnell's <laughs> actions, it's chance. When does someone die? Right. You know? Yeah, and so, it's, so it, has, it creates two, the current system creates two problems. One, it's a, the court judges are very out of sync with what voters want, but number two, uh, it creates this highly contested kind of nomination process, which we've all seen, which is you know a national crisis. You know when you know efforts to you know these these hearings are just and, and so if you had term limits, the regular term limits of 18 years, what this would allow is that every president could nominate two judges, and this would be enough kind of a very sounds so sensible, kind of, you know. And so this is why other again why other democracies have done this. So uh, so just some other ideas uh, we we call for. Protection of voting rights and expand and automatic voter registration, which is actually something that's happening in Pennsylvania just this week. Right. The governor of Pennsylvania. So this is something that has uh, uh, actively been proposed. Um, you know, there are other things on our list that other democracies have done that I, I think are probably out of reach. You know, making the Senate more proportionate to the population. Um, you know, that's something that's probably difficult. But most democracies in the world have done this. Yeah. In fact, either eliminated upper bodies or. or and then uh, something that doesn't require a constitutional amendment uh, um, is the elimination or at least the weakening of the filibuster, yeah. which is also another, another institution that's not in the Constitution that was really a practice that's only come into prevalence in the last 50 years. And you know, despite what people think that it was somehow rooted in the Constitution, not at all. No, the founding, and, and, and the founding besides, fathers they used were, to yeah. actually have to the, Jim, the Jimmy Stewart number. Right of actually speaking, yes. and now it's just, uh, right. just we uh, won't even consider that yeah, because we don't have the votes. Right, yeah. exactly. So this is something else we think we need so to So before we yes. turn it over to them, yeah. the two things you say it's going to take as long, we, we, you, we've got these, these changes proposed, we have not been changing enough, what will it take? Yeah, so I think there, the good news is I think there is a path, um, and that, I think that path goes through the filibuster. Uh, the filibuster doesn't require a constitutional amendment. It's a, simply a Senate rule. And one of the things that we note is that constitutional reforms tend to cluster together in other countries. So in other words, once you have one reform, you get lots of other reforms. And the reason that's the case is that momentum develops. And you know, in our current moment, I mean, there's probably some of you here thinking, well, this is all kind of unrealistic. You know, is this really going to happen? And again, it's our, the failure of our imagination. And because I mean, there's good reason to think that it's not going to happen because nothing has happened. But once reform does happen through the, 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 let's say, the elimination of the filibuster, it'll be suddenly easier to get other reforms through. And this kind of momentum can kind of develop. And then these other, you know, it'll be easier to protect voting rights because stuff won't get held, held up. Protection of voting rights won't get held up in the filibuster. Once more people can vote, broader majorities can be built. And I think that's the pathway to, to reform. And I guess I was thinking about, you, you said, one, get the ideas out there. Yeah. Get an agenda out there. Get people talking about it. Yes, and then be put, yeah, put pressure. relentless. Absolutely, and have patience. You have to be the kind of person who you know. You go to a party and you're talking about these issues once again. You know, I mean, people need to talk about this. Think about these things. 
you know, I, so the reason we wrote this book is that we want to tell people about this, and we want other people to tell other people about this. And at the end of the day, this is how reform has happened in the past. Pressure is put on politicians where they find it in their own interest to carry out these reforms. Yeah, and as you point out, suffrage, women's suffrage, for yeah. instance, and civil rights took generations. generations. Right. And, and, and you got to start somewhere. Yeah, and the other thing is you yeah. have hope in young people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the things. I mean, we, we think of this book as an optimistic book in the sense that although the barriers are there, you know, if the thing that I think primarily gives us hope is that, I th that younger voters, younger citizens, uh, really subscribe to the basic principles of multiracial democracy in a way right. that older people don't. You know, the, in these kind of core principles of accepting diversity and accepting political quality for everyone, it's clear that younger uh, yeah. voters, younger citizens really embrace this. And so at the end of the day, I think we need to empower this generation, and that's the, that's the idea for reforming our constitution. And I just want to say, I didn't even touch on a bunch of other things that interest the hell out of me and would you too. For instance, as what created the context for this current backlash and, yes. and you know what what were the what were the neglect that went into that we didn't touch on that but it's in the book right. and so on so now um let's turn it out to you guys thank you for coming out um and so in, i went to school in london and they had the house lords and it really doesn't do anything it's really one body so not saying whether it's possible or not but could you see a system in the united states where you just had the house of representatives and that would be it yeah, so many democracies um, had, up, almost all, all political systems in Western Europe had these upper chambers, usually aristocratic bodies. And the Senate was often called the kind of America's House of Lords because it sort of was in some sense modeled on this. Um, most systems, most of the Scandinavian democracies eliminated their upper chambers. And what's sort of fascinating, actually, there's some recent work that I've, I've seen on describing how in Sweden, once the upper chamber was eliminated, then suddenly there was all of these laws passed, equal rights amendments passed, and so on in the Swedish constitution, because this barrier was removed. I, in federal systems like the United States, it's much harder to eliminate upper chambers, because upper chambers represent states. So that's the difference between the US and Britain. So in a way, you know, I, you know, I think that we're probably stuck with the system of two senators per state, but the reason one, you know, there are alternatives. So that in Germany after World War II, the West German constitutional designers designed their constitution with American soldiers there advising them. And so they really actively considered whether they should set up a system, a Senate system as they called it, where every German state would have the same number of senators. They decided not to opt for that and instead opt for a system in which uh, bigger states have a little bit more representation. I mean, what, it's not perfectly proportional, but the biggest states have like five representatives, the small states two representatives, and that would be a more democratic outcome. So I think ultimately that's something that's a more viable solution in the United States than eliminating the Senate altogether. And let me just mention, as, as most of you know, but you put the number on it, it's outrageous. California with 35 plus million has the same number of senators as Wyoming with 600,000. So, and, and actually, you know, political scientists have tried to measure how, how the word that they use is malapportioned, and, but what that means is how unrepresentative it is given the number of representatives and the populations. And the, uh, in every democracy in the world, we're third from the bottom. The only countries that are less uh, malapportioned are uh, Argentina and Brazil. So, you know, and so on each of these kind of measures, like you sort of say, well, that's, you know, that's not the end of the world. But you add this with, you know, we're the only country with an electoral college, we're the only country with uh, lifetime appointments, all of these things added up, and then you kind of say, okay, well, this begins to make sense why we are where we are. Um, I was curious, one topic or area you didn't touch upon is demographics, and I try to remain optimistic in that, and you can tell me if this is valid, but I feel like the Republicans, it's sort of their last, last gasp with gerrymandering and voter restrictions because they're fighting against an inevitable you know, demographic change with uh, whites becoming more in the minority and people of color. And, you know, I'm trying to remain optimistic with my uh, son and daughter and the younger generation who don't hold the same views of Republicans. But I, I was hoping that maybe you can offer some optimism and, and looking 10 years with a demographic change, how will that affect our government? Yeah, so I, so I really agree, we, we do describe this, that, that this is kind of the, the force that's driving the authoritarian reaction, it, are these demographic shifts. Um, but that reaction is a minority force. I mean, the Republican Party is really in a minority party, and that faction of the Republican Party is certainly a, a minority within the population as a whole. 
And it's exaggerated, but you know, our point in some sense is that our constitution is, is exacerbating this transition because it overrepresents rural areas. I mean, that's basically always been the case in the US Constitution. But because today, you know, before it, historically Democrats and Republicans were kind of equally distributed across urban and rural areas. What's happened over time is that the Republican Party has become, the rural areas have become primarily the area of the Republican parties, urban areas, the party of, Dem, the, the region of Democrats. And so this now means the Republican Party uh, is representing a minority of the population, but it's overrepresented in the Constitution. And by the way, in s most states as well as nationally. Right, that's right. You see this in California certainly yeah. as well. Um, and so, you know, so that's why I think in the long, as, as, you, as you point out, I think in the long run, I'm quite optimistic. But, you know, I am concerned that in the medium run, we're kind of going through a rough uh, period where this, this struggle is taking place because, you know, it's really quite, rare phenomena historically for a demographic group to lose its majority status in a, in a society. Um, and that can be perceived to some as threatening. Uh, you know, I think it ought not be perceived as threatening, but I do think, as you say, I think younger, younger people don't see it as much of a threat. And so I think over the long run, there is reason for optimism. And one thing I always point out in terms of inclusivity and younger generations and so on, is television commercials, <laughs> right? Commercials are aimed at young people for the most part, except for all the pharmaceutical commercials. Um, <laughs> but you look, it is, I mean, the couples are mixed race. The, if there's five friends having beer together, they probably are five different races. They're, and they're not doing that because they're altruistic or, you know, they're doing that because that's what they, that's where they think the money is. And, and one other thing I would say is that it's really critical, you know, at some level that the sign of success would be as if, would be if we have two political parties competing for majorities. I mean, there, you know, a democracy needs at least two political parties. That's, I'd said that's one of the pillars of a democracy is competition. And we're currently in a period where, and in a moment where we have one party that is, that, that does not appeal to majorities and is able to win power. And, and so we have this kind of racial polarization, and I think ultimately that's quite dangerous. So, you know, in, in a way, I think, you know, part of the motivation of these institutional reforms is to change, to change the incentives for Republican politicians to reach out to broader segments of the electorate. And if, if the Republican Party had to win power by winning majorities, they would begin to fight about other things, and there would be policy debates. I mean, there may be things you disagree with, climate change and other, you know, immigration and other issues, but you know, there wouldn't be fighting, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be fights over race, there wouldn't be fights over democracy itself. It's like you're almost saying, it'll be good for you. Yes, right. You know, yeah, in the long run, it'll be good. And, and right. you're right. Yeah, you know, and I know, like, I think Nancy Pelosi has said something like this at some point, that, you know, we want a strong Republican right. Party. You know, and as a, as a political leader, maybe that's not the right thing to say, but I think as an analyst of democracy, it's certainly actually correct that we do need two political parties competing with each other right. on, on a democratic basis. Yeah. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you're optimistic because it's really hard sometimes to feel optimistic. Um, one of the things that we're looking at it, at the center is youth. Um, and by some measures, I think it's like 16% of Gen A, only 16% of Gen A says that they're proud to be American. And when I was a kid, even as marginalized as I felt, I still had this pride. And so how, how do we capture their yeah. spirit and, and like not let apathy and disenfranchisement take hold. Like, what do you think we can do? Yeah, no, that's great, great question. And, and I, you deal with young people. Yeah, yeah. You mean in my own in, in your work? Yes, yeah. right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I it, well, I do think that part of the sense of alienation comes from a sense that we don't have control over our own political system, and that there's really nothing that people can do to change things. And so, you know, I tell the story about the electoral college. People maybe don't know the story, history of the electoral college and you know, this failed effort, but that has a kind of infused our culture and we do have this, I think, a political culture where we think we can't control our own political system. And I guess what I, I would want people to kind of remember that, this, that, you know, that there is this American tradition of trying to make our constitution more democratic. And you know, there's a sense that you know, the issues that people care most about, let's say guns, you know, gun control, you know, where people's in schools, their lives are being affected. These, you know, this, these groups of, of young people who are pushing for gun control, incredibly frustrated that there's overwhelming majorities viewing, you know, with a view, uh, with one set of views, and it just keeps getting held up in the political system. So it makes sense that people can be disaffected. Or if you think of somebody born uh, in 1990, you know, and they've lived through, uh, you know, 
30 years, I mean, you know, 1990 is not that young, but you know, where you've lived through a period where the, you know, you, you, the president is often selected without being the winning, actually the, the person who wins the most votes. I mean, this has happened now twice. <coughs> Uh, and it could happen again anytime, you know, that it's hard to kind of have faith in the political system. So that's why I think these, even though these institutional reforms seem very distant and maybe very abstract, I think they're really critical because they, uh, they empower people to feel like they can actually make a change. And so that's why I think it's really critical for people who are in positions of responsibility to push for these reforms to allow people, majorities to speak. And I know you had said, I think you had said at the beginning that it's not democracy is more than just majority. That's absolutely right. But if we don't have majority rule, then you're going to have real problems of legitimacy. And so I think that's, that's really important. I just want to read a couple of quotes you had when the question was, so how are we going to change things? James Madison says, extremist minorities are best overcome through electoral competition. And Jane Addams says, the cure for ills of democracy is more democracy. Yeah. So it's it, it, those young people who are disaffected have to get um, excited, have to get, have to see the possibility and act on it. Yeah, and, and, and you know, in another, we have another line where we describe, you know, the kind of how to think about our own history. And this comes from a, a initially from a speech from a German president, the German president, who's currently the German president, who said, it's important to learn to love your country with a broken heart. Yes. Um, you know, and what that means, and he, and he says, there's nothing as whole as a broken heart. Um, and you know what this means is you don't you don't have to overlook. I mean, this is a kind of fa false dichotomy that you have to say our country is great. I'm proud to be an American and turn a blind eye to things that have gone wrong. Um, you have to be able to recognize things that have gone wrong and understand that we can improve it. And that you know that that's a way. And really confronting the history is a way of loving your country. And I think that's something that we all and embrace. the Germans, of course, know this well. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because that was supposed to be one of my finishing things. This yeah. was the love with a yes. broken heart thing. Yeah. I have a question. Um, would you address the? Um, I mean, Iowa and New Hampshire hardly represent the majority, but typically winnow down the field on both sides significantly. Do you have any recommendations how that process can change? So the primary process. Correct. Right? Yeah, so the Democratic Party now has abandoned that, actually. I think they've now skipped Iowa. So um, although this is not you know, particularly relevant necessarily this time around. But um, uh, the Republican Party, though, obviously, is continuing with this system. So it's up to the parties to decide this. I think more broadly, and, it, it, and it's, you're right that it's, um, you know, the whole primary process is a kind of arbitrary process. I mean, we, you know, before 1972, party leaders got together in smoke-filled rooms and hotels at convention halls and sort of decided on who was the best uh, politician to run for president. Uh, that was not democratic, but it did have the virtue that the guys who knew the politicians best, and it wasn't usually guys, um, uh, you know, could say, well, this person's dangerous, they're a demagogue, they're kind of a drunk or whatever. They keep these people well, up. It, even more. Yeah. It, 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 it didn't give the base, right. the extreme base of each party, the enormous power the primaries did. The, the post-McGovern reforms that brought us right. the primaries, I, I actually worked in the national staff of that campaign as a 24-year-old. <laughs> um, but the, the, what they imagined primaries doing, which is being more democratic, has turned right. out to right. uh, elevate the base. Yeah, and, and the reason is that in some sense, they're not really fully democratic. I mean, there's high, very low voter turnout, it's a kind of idiosyncratic set of states, um, and so it's it's a broken process, um, and it's what got us 2016. Um, you know, no, you know, nobody, Republican leaders didn't want Trump to be the big money wasn't behind Trump even. You know, so this is this kind of system where we we got this person into office who has you know this we're still living with this, and it was a kind of arbitrary process at some level, right? So, uh, and you might say, well, he won the most votes, but you know. It, Depending if you had a different sequence of states, you might have gotten a different outcome, and that kind of suggests a certain arbitrary quality to it. So, but it's up to unfortunately, it's up to the parties to decide, or maybe fortunately. I mean, it's not constitutional; uh, it's not driven by the constitution. There's nothing. I mean, the word party, political party doesn't even appear in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so, this is really a kind of independent thing for the parties themselves to decide. But I think the Democratic Party is making the right move of trying of changing the sequence of states. To kind of choose states, I forget. I think they've now selected South Carolina. South Carolina, yeah. which which is a has a diverse population compared to Iowa and right. and Vermont. So yeah, so I mean that would be one way 
of, a lot, of generating a more, I mean, if the Republican Party wanted to be a more diverse party and wanted to reach out to a more diverse set of voters, one way of addressing that would be to change the states that you use to select your presidential candidate. Uh, I read a book about 30 years ago by uh, Michael Friedman, I think, called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. Mm -hmm. And his whole theme was that from the beginning of the time, the people with the money and power could lord it over the masses because the masses had no way. And that the internet was eventually going to change all that. And I just wondered if, do you see the fact, I mean, <laughs> Aside from the fact the fake news and everything, and the younger generation, I think is I think is becoming more aware of the fact they have to check their facts; they can't just read it. But do you believe that the internet is going to help uh, the world become more of a of a equal place, or do you think that that's just a pipe yeah, dream? Yeah, I think I think yeah, I think it's a it's certainly a double at best a double edged sword. I mean, in the sense, like all technology. Um, you know, radio and television uh, was kind of a great instrument of liberation for some, but on the other hand was used by, you know, I mean, the way Hitler came to power was through uh, speeches on the, on the radio. And then Rwanda. And Rwanda the as well, that's right. So it can be, so too, like with all tools, they can be used for good and for ill. And I think there was a period initially when, with the rise of new media technology, social media and, you know, the Twitter, the, the Arab Spring was in some ways, uh, you know, flourished because of the use of Twitter. Um, and so it was a kind of vehicle of uh, kind of arena where authoritarian governments didn't have control. But of course then, you know, people catch up, you know, authoritarians catch up and uh, can use social media and media control to entrench themselves in power. I have a colleague at, at Harvard who has uh, looked at uh, kind of how censorship is work, works in, in China as a way of controlling what information people have. and and really has been able to identify what kinds of things get censored. And the things that gets, what they do is they kind of scrape the web at moments before the censors take, you know, very, very quickly are able to look at things that get posted and then look at things that get taken down and then can kind of try to reconstruct, well, what is the goal here? And it turns out is what, what the Chinese government often tries to do is not, it doesn't try to stamp out critical opinions. What it does is tries to stamp out gatherings like this of people, of more than several people. Because the idea is that the biggest threat is groups that are supportive or critical gathering, and so wow. and so media can be used to control this as well. So so and then certainly in our own democracies, uh, social media has been used has been a vehicle that has has dismantled hierarchies, but I don't think in the way that Friedman originally um, intended. You know, because it, what it has done is weaken the gatekeepers, which you know maybe sounds democratic. But on the other hand, if we, you know, if this means that, you know, everybody thinks they're a, a climate expert or a kind of expert on, on COVID, then, you know, this also means that there's a kind of decay of what counts as truth and so on. So it's a double-edged sword, sword, I think, at best, and we are still trying to figure out how to regulate it, how to manage it, and I don't think we really have figured out a kind of equilibrium yet. But I mean, but I, but you're right that people have. But it is a liberating tool. I mean, I do. I mean, but it, and in some sense, it's double edged. Though I think is how I would think about it. Well, basically, for about forty years, I was upset that so many of my friends that were would have been liberals, progressive liberals, didn't pay attention to politics at all. Yeah. And I have been saying for the last whatever that if we get through Trump that it will be the best thing that happened to America because people are paying attention now, especially the younger generation who's afraid of climate change. And um, is it possible that Trump might be good for this country? <laughs> well, we certainly, it is true that we are certainly much more aware of the fact that our democracy is fragile and that it needs, and we have to be vigilant. Um, but, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the, the Madison Jefferson line that I said before in the wilderness, not, you know, we, uh, you know, we aren't like, Matt, you know, I said that Madison wrote to Jefferson saying, we're like, feels like we're in the wilderness with no footsteps to follow. You know, we don't have to, uh, we, we can learn from others. You know, we don't have to go through trauma ourselves in order to learn. Actually, there's a wonderful line from Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, the 19th century German statesman. He says, you know, only the fool learns from his own mistakes. The wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Um, you know, so that's why I write these books, is because you know, I think we need to learn from the histories of other places. We shouldn't have to put our entire nation at risk in order to 
realize, oh, you know, maybe we should be a little more careful. Um, we can learn this from looking at other places. And, and I would just say that we, got, we survived, except for all of those unnecessarily dead from COVID, we survived Trump's first term. I don't know that democracy survives Trump's second term. Yeah. And, you know, and I think a lot of this, again, has to do with our, we have to think about why are we in this situation? Um, and, you know, what, you know what is, what's put us here? Because in, unless we figure that out, we're going to end up here. Again. And as I, as I confess, that was a section of the book and of your thinking that we did not get into, yeah. which is that what created the context for this backlash uh, that led to Trump and, and not just Trump, but the whole, the, the whole sensibility of angry, white, elderly people, yeah. Uh, that's certainly part of it, yeah. And, and I would say, and neoliberalism. That they, they, they were, they were, there were warranted grievances and there were unwarranted bigotry, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah but, I th but again, I think our, our, our institutions have made this problem worse because we haven't, you know, the, the, there's always gonna be people who are upset, but that doesn't mean that our democracy should have to be at risk when one party gains power. I mean, that's, that's not, right. we shouldn't have to accept that as a, as a normal condition. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Terrence. <laughs>